Worship Center. Can we put our hands together for Jesus this morning? It's been quite a week, but we are excited about being here this morning. And we are excited about praising God together and worshiping together this morning. Can you just look at your neighbor and just tell him I'm happy to see you? Happy to see you this morning. It took us a while to get started, but we are here. And since we're here in the presence of the Lord, we are excited about being in his house of worship. We choose to worship the Lord. You have to make a decision, right? Conscious decision to worship him. So today, we just want to acknowledge God's presence and acknowledge that he is here in this space. And that whatever it is that you came in here seeking for, you will find it. How many of you believe that you will find what you're looking for? Amen and amen. We're going to offer a word of prayer before we sing this morning. If you all will please stand with us and let's acknowledge God's presence. God, we thank you this morning. Even though we are late getting started, God, you are already here. You were already here. You have entered this place, God. And you told us to enter in with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, God. We will be thankful unto you. We will bless your name, God, because you are good and because your mercy endures forever. Will you please come down and be with us this morning? We don't want to start this service without you. We don't want to do anything without you, God. So we ask you, Lord, to be in every song, be in every prayer. God, be in the sermon. God, be in every announcement. Be in everything today, Father. For we do not want to do anything without you. God, forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings because all of us have made some mistakes this week, Lord. But God, we give it all to you today. And we ask you, Father, to please come. Lord, be reverenced today. God, come and be magnified today. Come and be lifted higher above our problems and our situations today, Lord. We just give it all to you and we say thank you for your presence. We say thank you for your power. We say thank you, God, for being so awesome to us. Thank you for being our strength when we are weak, God. We give your name glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. He is here. Praise his name. You can remain standing if you want. We just want to acknowledge God's presence and the song is He is Here. If you know it, sing along with us. We thank you, Lord, this morning. We give your name glory this morning, God. Hallelujah. Everybody sing, He is Here. He is Here. Praise His name.
day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm near, I wonder how many are happy to be in the house of God today. How many are happy to be in the land of the living? How many are happy to be on the earth and not in the earth? How many are happy to be seen and not viewed? We are so grateful for God's goodness and his gratefulness and, and his greatness and his godness. We are so thankful uh, that you are here with us for our worship service as we lift the name of Jesus high. And I don't know about you, I didn't bring my jumper cables today. And so I don't know what y'all waiting for, but I've come to praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, amen. If, if y'all if y'all want to be dead today, I'll call the funeral home. But but for those who came to give God praise, and those who came to lift up his name, praise the Lord. I'm going to know where the praises are at. We welcome you to the Trinity Worship Center experience. We are so grateful that you're in this place. We know that there are so many places uh, within the greater Charlotte area that would have loved to have your attendance. And we know that there are so many great churches in the greater Charlotte area where you could have attended today. But you saw it fit to come and join us here at Trinity Worship Center. And we welcome you. And for those who are watching online by Streaming Faith, we are so glad uh, that all, of all the churches that are right at your fingertips that you could have tuned into today. You saw it fit to tune into us, and for this, we are glad, and we welcome you to our service. We want to acknowledge and uh, recognize the fact that there are many people who may be new to Charlotte. Maybe you're here for school. Uh, maybe you just recently moved to Charlotte, and you're looking for a church home to call your own. We ask that you would consider Trinity Worship Center, where we would be happy to be your church family. Amen. And I would be honored to be your pastor. So once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. If we could all stand to our feet and just spend 47 seconds greeting each other, telling them how much you missed them and love them, and tell them I'm happy to see you in the house of God today. Give me some music, guys.
Praise God. Amen. 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 Don't you feel a little bit better today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I wonder what you're looking for in 2024. To know God more. That is our mantra. That is our goal for this year. And we are endeavoring to seek him and to find him. The Bible says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And that is our goal for 2024, to search for God with all our heart, to know God better, and to have a deeper and more lasting relationship with him. Amen. And we invite everyone to join us every Monday morning for our Monday morning manna at 6 a.m. on Zoom. And we will, it will be our weekly uh, day of fasting and prayer. And we invite you to come and knock on heaven's door with us through prayer. I also want to let you know that today the senior ministry will be having lunch and a meeting immediately following uh, service today. Okay, the senior ministry would have lunch and a meeting immediately following service today uh, the singles ministry will not be meeting today um, but we will have our elders if I if I could have all the elders to meet me in the VIP room uh, directly after service just for a brief meeting today all the elders of the church if you can meet me in the VIP room briefly after service today I would appreciate that and I'm excited about our annual Seven Last Words of Christ program. Amen. That'll be next Sabbath here at 5 o'clock p.m. You don't want to miss it. We're going to bring some thunder and some lightning. Amen. Into this church. And we want to see every face in the place. Come on. Say amen. And we look forward to seeing each and every one of you here. A night of music and inspirational preaching. And uh, just a night of wonderful fellowship. Uh, the new members class resumes uh, this Thursday. We're inviting everybody uh, who's joined the church from January through March. Uh, if you can uh, see Sister Katrina Heath or anyone from the CIA team uh, to avail yourselves for the weekly uh, Bible study and meeting with the CIA. And then we invite you to join us every Sabbath morning for Sabbath school at 9.45 a.m. It's uh, in Zoom, on Zoom and in person. And we invite you to join us every Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. for our weekly prayer meeting service. And uh, please continue to observe social protocols as we want to spread nothing here but the love of Jesus. Amen. And so make sure we're sanitizing. If you're sick, uh, you can stay home for a week or two until you feel better. And we promise that we will stream as best as our ability each and every service, every Sabbath. Amen. Uh, but if you are available and able, we invite you to come to the house of God. Uh, please continue to support our church with your giving, your tithe, and your offering. There's a tithe. There's a... There was a bucket in the, by the door. <laughs> I don't know where it went, uh, but you can give on your way in or out of service every week, and we will send the offering basket around at the appropriate time. Uh, we invite you to, uh, we would prefer if you give online at AdventistGiving.org, where we would, uh, if you put where you want your funds to go, Treasury would honor that, and we are grateful for uh, your continued support of our church and our ministry. Amen. All of this is possible by your giving. Come on, say amen. And so it's important for us um, to do our part uh, in making sure that the ship stays afloat. And so we pray that we would continue to give in our tithe and our offerings, our free will offerings for the advancement of God's kingdom. And uh, for those who are watching online, please make sure you like and share this video. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube page uh, so that those on your timeline will know that you have, uh, you, you're getting a good word and maybe it might be relevant for them as well. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And today we have a testimony from one of my brothers, James Bennett Jr., who we went to Northeastern Academy together and Oakwood together. And he would like to share his testimony of what God has done before we sing our hymn of the morning. And so hear ye him. God bless you as we worship today in spirit and in truth. All right, well, 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right, so it's quite frankly very noticeable that I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, what's so interesting is that I had made a promise to God that if he answered my prayers, that I would have no choice but to be up here. And so. All right, so I guess the first thing I'll start by saying is the story of my life is very interesting and it goes much, if I were to talk about that, it'd be all day. However, what we will start at is 2016. So in 2016, I married the best woman in my life. Jendai Howell at the time, now known as Jendai Bennett. She was the best and is the best person to have ever happened to me. Now, here's what's interesting. We got married on July 30th, 2016. And while that was the most exciting time in my life, Earlier that year, my grandfather, Robert Bennett, passed away. Now, you have to understand how close we were and how angry I was at God for that happening. And quite frankly, I stopped believing in prayer. And quite frankly, I really, it's, it was difficult. I, I don't want to say that I stopped believing in God because I knew he was there but I stopped believing that he honestly did anything for me. And I did not like coming to church and pretending that God is good. You know, I didn't feel like he was good. I know he was good to other people, but it didn't feel like he was good to me. Also, my wife's mother passed away from cancer that same year, about a month later. So during our wedding, my grandfather, who was supposed to officiate our wedding, was not there. And my wife's mother was not there. You can imagine the bitter but sweet feelings that was going on. And so um, it was a lot for us to really handle. And at the same time as the years uh, passed, we tried our very best to be able to move forward together, lots of crying, lots of happy times, happy moments. But also during that time, you also got a chance to learn just how, uh, how church people do not reach out to you. They're your friends when, at least so it seemed, not for every church, I won't say this church, I wasn't here. But what I will say is that when things seem when, when, when the loved ones are alive, you're remembered. You're a part of a family. They tell you that they're gonna be there for you. But then suddenly when it's time to put that to the test and they pass, you might get one or two people who to this day still will try to check on you and will see how you're doing and, rec and help you realize that you're not forgotten. So you can imagine the anger that I really felt. I had felt a lot of anger, but that wasn't just it. So my wife and I, you know, on our first year of marriage, of course we decided we wanted to enjoy ourselves. Didn't feel like having any uh, children. We felt like the best way to get to enjoy marriage is to enjoy your first year. We don't want any children at that point in time, get to go different places, which we did. But then year two comes and we're like, okay, let's start deciding if we want to have kids. We know we want kids, but let's start practicing for that. And of course, yes, my wife is amazing. If you look at her, I mean, obviously I'm a lucky man. But then nothing happens that year. And we kind of chalk it up to, well, you know what? We still live in an apartment. We still, you know, uh, have things that we want to get done. 
we still want to, you know, make sure that we're ready to have children. So year three comes by. And at this point, I'm starting to get frustrated. And I'm starting to feel like, well, why is it that it seems like people are just getting together and they're having kids very quickly and nothing is happening with us, but yet we try to chalk it up. And you hear people starting to say, well, you know, you don't want to rush having kids. Enjoy yourself while you are married. Enjoy that because once you have kids, oh, it's all over. You hear that often. Year four passes and nothing. And at this point, you could start to see in my mood just how bitter I started to become. Because what got me so angry is you got these people saying, pray about it. And I felt like, okay, well, prayer's not working. Been praying about it for four years. Also, I was getting angry because you see these people who are saying, do not rush it. But you do not understand the anger that a person who wants children, but they just can't have them, how that feels to hear someone who has kids tell you to just be patient and that God is going to answer your prayer and that you don't want to rush it anyway. You don't have that place to tell someone that. And then to top it off, to see people who just get children and then they treat them terribly and then they abuse them and then they go and sometimes end their children's lives. And I'm sitting there like, how in the world is it that you got these people who don't deserve kids having them and yet you have someone who wants to have children who wants to be a dad who wants to who has a wife who wants to be a mom so year five passes and of course that nothing happens year six now I'm saying to myself, no, there's definitely something wrong with me. And of course, my wife, she's trying to uh, help me to feel better about it. We go and get tested. And of course, everything seems fine. Um, some of the soldiers don't seem to, I mean, they, there are plenty. <laughs> there are plenty, but it's like trying to push a square up a mountain they don't want to move and so we found out that that was part of the issue something easily able to be fixed um, and so uh, we go ahead and get ourselves prepared for that and yet nothing happens that was year six and I remember I'd come to church and I'd be angry. And I would see these little kids, they'd come up on choirs and they'd be singing and getting on their parents' nerves and all that fun stuff. And I would be the one who's crying because I'm sitting there like, man, some of you just don't have any idea how good you have it. And I started to compare myself from the perspective of the only people I could say who understand this feeling or better yet, I don't know, I wouldn't even know what's worse is the parent or, or the person who is struggling to have children, who want children but can't have it no matter whatever the reason is, or the person who's had kids but lost them. Two different boats, but yet that's the only thing I could compare myself to in, the under, in, in, in trying to understand how that felt. And so, obviously, we go and we, on our seventh year, decide we're going to do 
uh, not IVF, but IUI. And so IVF, if some of you guys are aware, is when you take the sperm and you take the egg, and you put it together, and they're able to, you know, allow for a child to grow. IUI is, of course, when you take the soldiers because they don't want to move and you just give them a nice subway ride to where the eggs or egg is. And so in August of last year, we go and we do our, 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 our IUI, uh, we start the journey. And we do it. And we're like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. Can't wait. And we go for the test and nothing happens. So now you have to understand, this is seven years. And we're trying to figure out what's going on with us. What's going on with me? My wife was fine. But it was me. Which, by the way, leads me into talking about this thing that men do not send to talk about, and they suffer in silence. And that is the feeling of being uh, less than. Because as a man, society teaches that you're supposed to be able to not only be strong, You're not supposed to only be able to provide, but you're also supposed to be able to have your kids and to be able to propagate the world. And yet I wasn't doing that. And there's not a lot of talk on it. And a lot of men suffer in silence because of it, or they don't get tested to even know. Oftentimes the pressure is only put on the wife or the woman. But I do recommend getting tested if that is something that's going on. Anyway, so then in October, well, November of last year, we go for our second test. I didn't expect it to work, to be honest. I did not expect it to work because I didn't care any. It's not that I didn't care, but I just did not, I just didn't have faith anymore. And that's just real. I did not have faith. And my sister and my grandma and everyone else is saying that they pray. They're like, yeah, we're praying for you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Nice. It's good to hear. Sure. Whatever you guys do, that's on y'all. Whatever. But then came one morning. And my wife and I are just in the bed just talking. And she's like, hey, let's go ahead and just do the pregnancy test. And I'm like, okay, got my video out because, I mean, we're trying to do our journey along the way. Didn't expect anything to occur. And then I heard my wife say, oh, my God. You have to understand (laughs) the excitement and the tears that I started to share and that my wife started to, to, to express because I just did not believe that my wife was finally pregnant. Seeing that nice positive sign on there. Cause we used two pregnancy tests. We wanted to make sure one that said in red pregnant because I wanted to make sure I understood it right. And the next one that had the positive sign also that was there. So we were happy about that. And that was awesome. And I was like, you know what, God? Fine. <laughs> you do answer prayers for me and for her. But not only is that the case, so we go to the doctor and get checked out. And they're like, oh my goodness. It looks like we have twins. <laughs> so God has given us not one, but two. And so when God says that he will sometimes double your blessing, 
He has shown me that in fact, he will go above and beyond. And I felt it was interesting because in losing my grandmother and, I mean, not my grandmother, I'm so sorry. Grandma's right there. I love you, Grandma. But my grandfather and my mother-in-law, who I never got a chance to get to know. God, it seems like, was like, here's a replacement. Not a replacement, but something that you can put that will fill a hole that is there. So I wanted to share this with you because I know for a fact that there are people who are either here or online who are experiencing what it is that I have gone through, what my wife has gone through. And I want you to know that you can just hold on. And if God does not answer in giving you the ability to have a pregnancy, there is still adoption. There are a number of children who deserve and need love that you can provide, that you can give. And any blessing that God gives is a blessing that was meant just for you. And so that was just something that I wanted to share. Thank you for giving me that opportunity and time. Thank you for sharing. I want your wife to come, Sister Bennett Jr., if you could come quickly. We want to pray for you for a safe delivery, a safe pregnancy. Come on, put your hands together for the, the, the sister with the twins. Listen, God can do anything but fail. Do, are there any believers in the house that God is able to do just what he said he will do? Never give up on God because he won't give up on you. He'll give you double for nothing. He, he'll give you overflow. And he'll give you more than you ask for. And so let's bow and pray. Almighty Father and our God, we thank you for this beautiful couple. Lord, they waited for a perfect time. Seven years of trying and working and, and, un, un, and overturning every stone to wait for your yes. And Father, we thank you for this season. Lord, we pray that you would cover them. We pray that you would provide for them abundantly. Let them live in the overflow. We pray, oh God, that Sister Bennett Jr. would have a safe pregnancy and a safe delivery. We pray for two healthy babies with all of their fingers and toes. We pray that their minds will be sharp and that they will serve you and excel in school and make their parents proud. Continue to strengthen our faith. Lord, we needed this testimony today because others of us may not be pregnancy, but we're going through our own struggles where we're wondering, where is God? But thank you for reminding us that you may not come when, you want, when we want you, but you always come right on time. So bless this beautiful couple, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. And so with that being said, we're about to sing a hymn um, that goes perfectly with the testimony, Standing on the Promises. So um, will everybody please stand as we sing?
about the goodness of God. You see, God may not operate when you want to, but he's going to operate for you on time. I can give you testimony upon testimony. Another one close to better than that I got last week, but I'm not going to do that because it's time to pray. You'll hear it soon. It's going to blow your mind, but God is good. It's not about what you feel. Is about what it is. Because feelings is going to fail you almost every time. You just have to hold on and realize the devil's putting you through some stuff that you need to realize that God has defeated the devil already. And if you don't realize that, you're going to be lost because when the pressure's put on and not too far soon down the road, you're going to fall. But it be your fault because his promises are sure. It's just not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. Somebody may be going through some stuff this week. And I'm just trying to tell you God, God is allowing you to go through a test to provide you a testimony. You see, you can't get to heaven without a test. And you must pass the test. Are you studying for the test? I just pray, I just pray that I'm ready for when my test comes. And I want to encourage you, no matter what's going on, no matter what has happened in your life, you just trust God. Get on your knees, surrender to him, and call other people to pray for you. Because it's in the, it's in the prayers of many that God will work on your behalf for the saving of the soul and somebody else is going to be saved. If you want prayer, you can come up. I'm going to pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the exhilarating testimony of God, God through disappointment, through grief and pain, and even depression, Lord. It forgotten, it's turned and is blaming you. And many times we do that, Lord. But you still show up and show out as only you would do for your people. God, we all are going through something. Either going through something now or getting ready to go through a storm. We just, we just ask you, Lord, to give us why exactly what we need spiritually to hold on because you're coming soon Lord you said be that we must be ready because when we think not you shall come Lord we have some among us that have some illnesses Lord we've seen miracles but we understand Lord that you are the greatest physician and so right now, Lord, I ask you to forgive our sins. And we are asking you, Lord, to work in their behalf. Sister Jones, I believe this week is going through a procedure, Lord. And I'm asking you right now in the name of Jesus Christ 
to be the physician. You see, direct the hands and, and we just thank you, Lord, for the outcome. And I ask you, Lord, continue to pour the blessings upon her and her family. But most of all, Lord, heal her, Lord. We thank you. There's some others. Our brother there, Jerry, who's been going through his situation for a while. And he's in and out, and we, we, our minds are like we're on steroids. But we realize, Lord, that you are going to answer and deliver him too. I remember speaking to him not too long ago personally. And he said, let me tell you something. He said this to me. And I tell you the church, he said, soon I'll be in the sanctuary healed and given the testimony. I prayed, Lord. I said, I said, Jerry, you're going to be here. I thank God for giving you an inspiration. Be with his family too as they tarry long in this situation. Lord, I pray for the many others that have issues going on that God that you will send your Holy Spirit to be with them to tr touch their bodies Lord we have some folks that want to come to church and have issues getting to church we ask Lord that you solve this make me the solution and we're asking you Lord that we all will be involved with personal evangelism Lord you are wrapping things up rapidly we see America can't even get along. And so we're, instead of the United States of America, we're in the divided States of America, and it's even getting worse. And soon you will have to come, because if you don't come, look like all of us will be destroyed for ignorance and the devil put in pressure on Lord be with the Palestinians, Lord, over there being destroyed by the accomplice, the United States of America, takes in our tax dollars and killing people. And I actually thank you, Lord, that you're going to take care of those people that's responsible for bringing death to innocent lives. But God, right now, I pray, as the speaker, your manservant comes and deliver the message that we all need, Lord, that our heart, not only our hearts be touched, but the Holy Spirit will speak to us, remove the devil from the audience so everybody would get what they need today. And I thank you and I praise you for what you shall do. Is my prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Next on the agenda is the tithes and offering. But before I go into that, the Bible does tell us that the leaves of the trees free are for the healer of the nation. And I tell people this, let your food be your medicine before your medicine becomes your food. There is a little known vitamin that many people don't even realize. And the vitamin is vitamin K2. Many people do not know what K2 does for them and their health. And if you're suffering with high blood pressure, arteriosclerosis, bone loss, anything to deal with the strength of the bones on the circulatory system, vitamin K2 actually takes calcium, calcium that's deposited into the, into the soft tissue of the body, such as your arteries and veins, and works synergetically with vitamin D to pull calcium that's deteriorating your arteries and cause you problems with the pressure and actually puts it in the bones and strengthen the bones matrix. And if the, you have decalcification many times, uh, a blood vessel that does not relax and expand when the brain talks to it will begin doing it and save you problems with problems with circulatory disorder, diabetics, blood pressure, and all those issues. So you should be looking at K2 to put in your, in your regimen. I do it every day, and I can tell you, I know it works because guess what? When I do my heart scans, it shows that it works. I'm just letting you know. Now the information provided for general education is not intended to substitute for medical advice. We are thankful to God that 
we can give. And when we give, God expects as we come to worship that we uh, come with an offering. You see, many times in the, in the black churches, folks just show up with a dollar. What is a dollar going to do for the work of the Lord? We want to keep money because we're selfish and we would r rather keep our money than give to the cause of God. But you want the preacher to give a good sermon and you don't even want to contribute to the war Lord's work. The blessing is in giving and giving as much because God is going to return to you what beyond what you can give. And so I praise God for that. Let us pray. Merciful Father, Lord, we thank you for the offering. We just ask you, Lord, remove the, 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 the selfishness from us that we may give even more because whatever we give, that you shall give back more to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The blessing is in the giving. Amen. Amen. We serve a mighty God and an awesome God. God is so good. I think um, James, the junior, he said he had little faith, right? But how many know? I know he's a believer now. Where are you at? I believe, come on, we can take it down. I believe that God, he is the God of miracles. He is the God of wonders, amen. He is all powerful and we believe, amen. So you can join in with us. James, I need you jumping on this one, okay? Is that all right? Hey! You gonna have to get up for this one, y'all. Y'all can sit there if you like, but it's time to get up and praise the Lord. Come on. Jehovah God and we trust you God we believe in you you are the God of miracles and wonders hallelujah everybody knows this song come on hey, hey, hey. come on you can get into it you ready I see you you might as well join in with us come on we got Jehovah Jehovah, Jehovah, I trust, I trust in you.
somebody SOS Scoot over, scoot over some Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I see you over there Put your hands together right here Cause we gonna tell all the things that we don't want in our life Bye bye, alright <laughs> So long bye bye Come on everybody say Long bye bye Goodbye to my pain and my sorrow So long bye bye Come on, I think y'all got it now So long, so long continue to be with us and let him know that he is our shepherd he is our guide he continues to walk beside us the word says yea though I walk through the valley of the of the shadow of death I will do what fear no evil because God stands with us and that's enough to give him praise for right there you got a big God standing right in front of you standing right beside you, standing right behind you, standing all over you. Amen. You are protected under the blood of Jesus. Can we give God praise just for the blood of Jesus that continues to cover us even when we can't cover ourselves? We want to, but we can't. We need his blood. And the song simply says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. 
He's the defender behind me. He is fighting every battle that you are going through. Some of y'all think you're fighting it by yourself, but I'm just here to let you know. The praise team is here to let you know you're not alone. Can you look at your neighbor and say, you are not alone? Hallelujah. You got a big God fighting for you today. So whatever storm you got, I know my mother is here. Whatever storm you got going through this week, hallelujah. God already said he's your defender. He's your healer. He's your protector. And it's not just for her, but for all of us here. Whatever you are going through, just believe God today. Song simply says, the Lord is. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. So I won't fear. I won't fear. I'm filled with his anointing. I'm filled with the anointing. My cup's overflowing. My cup's overflowing. Today. He goes before me. He goes before me. He is the defender behind me. Defender behind me. 
Almighty Father, we thank you for being our comfort and our guide. We thank you for keeping us close beside you. Even when we wander away from you, 
we thank you for chasing after us. Lord, we praise your name today because you are so highly exalted. Father, we pray that you would accept our worship today. Bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. We don't invite him. We know he's here. We just ask you to stay a little while longer as we sit at your feet. Would you clear your throat and speak from heaven and speak so clearly that all of us will understand your will. Remove everything that is within me that should prevent me from speaking to your people today. Father, give me that special anointing that makes preaching easy. And we will be careful to give you all the glory and the honor and the thanks in this. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever more and all God's people shout amen come on give God glory praise God for our praise team today for leading us so wonderfully praise God for you and why don't you put your hands together for our band today? Amen. Amen. We're so grateful for your contribution in worship to everyone who's working the sound, the cameras, uh, to make uh, good production. We thank you to our deacons and to our ushers and everybody who's made this worship service uh, an experience. Thank you so much for your contribution in worship. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. And there, I want us to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. When you found it, may I invite you to stand with me today as we read God's word. Sister Belk, is that you? It's good to see you in the house. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 17. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If you would allow me today, I want to talk to you under the topic, the real running man. The real running man. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the house of God today. Several years ago, I don't know if you remember, and uh, we want to invite all the children to join us in the large classroom for choir rehearsal. All the children that are part of the choir join us uh, in the large classroom at this time uh, for choir rehearsal. I don't know if you remember, there was some time ago a new, uh, air quote, new uh, dance craze that exploded on social media uh, called the Running Man Challenge. Uh -huh. uh, the Running Man Challenge is where people would upload clips of themselves doing the Running Man dance 
uh, to a popular 90s song. It was a lot of fun for those who participated in the challenge and for anyone who's watched the thousands of comical renditions on Facebook, Instagram, and Snap of people doing uh, the Running Man Challenge. Uh, but I hesitate to call it a new uh, dance craze because the Running Man in its current representation or presentation uh, revolves around the style of dance that was made popular way back in the 1980s. Uh, by MC Hammer and, uh, and, and you know, uh, y'all tell it on yourself. Uh, y'all remember, can't touch this. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> so, so in response, and this, I'm talking, this happened around about 2016, 2017, in response to the many clips of individuals doing the new Running Man Challenge, uh, some of our brothers and sisters from Generation X, uh, that's 1966 to 1980, uh, they responded as best they could uh, with the new, uh, to the new Running Man challenge, but with videos of what they call the real Running Man. Yeah, in an attempt to be clear, uh, today's Running Man is totally different from the 1980s uh, version of the Running Man that everyone from MC Hammer uh, to Vanilla Ice did. Come on, uh, they performed it for years. Uh, and, and when doing what they called the real running man, uh, they were exaggeratedly running in place. I wish I could demonstrate for you today. <laughs> y'all just, y'all just, y'all just so unsanctified, man. <laughs> well, they, 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 <laughs> they were exaggeratedly running in place, bringing their knees up high, Punching their arms forward. Can y'all see it? <laughs> That's what they call the real running man. Uh, but, but today, <laughs> today, <laughs> lest I divert the sermon to a dance contest, uh, <laughs> today I want to talk to you about the really real running man. Yeah, his name was Jonah. Uh, and the book attributed to his name opens up with a divine assignment. The Bible says that Jehovah spoke to Jonah in his own unique and powerful way. And he told Jonah to do two things. He told him to go to Nineveh and cry out against it. And this was intended to be a rebuke for against them because of their sin. And it was a call for them to uh, know repentance uh, because according to the end of verse 2, if you could bring my verse up, gentlemen, I don't think this is working. According to the end, according to the end of verse 2, the Bible says uh, that their wickedness meter was so high that it reached the presence of the Almighty God. Uh, and I often wonder to myself, how high is our wickedness meter today? Uh, because in our day, we see that our feet are swift uh, to do evil, but slow to do good. How high is our wickedness meter today? Uh, violence is commonplace, and terrorism is on the rise, and nation is rising against nation. And now the wars seem to be making less and less sense. How high is our wickedness meter today? Uh, sexual immorality prevails, and, and even children are being molested, even by trusted people. How high is our wickedness meter today? And Arthur wants to be Martha, and Martha wants to be Arthur, and the wickedness meter of Nineveh caught God's attention. Now let's look at the city. The city of Nineveh was a great city located in the east bank of the Tigris River, about 55, 550 miles from the northern kingdom of Israel. And Nineveh appeared to Jonah as an impregnable fortress with both an outer wall and an inner wall that was 50 feet wide and 100 feet high. Nineveh measured 90 miles in circumference and it had a population of 600,000 people. And there was a garden city and one of the great wonders 
of the world. We're told that Nineveh was the largest city in the world at that time. It was the largest and most important capital of the dominating empire. It was, it was a pagan Gentile territory and history tells us that the Ninevites were some cruel godless people. Uh, one historian suggested that they were known for intentionally breaking all of God's commandments. These people would cut off their enemies' heads and place them on spikes and leave the spikes uh, at the perimeter of the city. These were the ones that God sent Jonah to to call to, to repentance. What an intimidating assignment, don't you agree? Jonah, according to chapter 1 and verse 9, was a strong Jew and no other prophet in the Bible was so strongly directed to a non-Jewish nation. Uh, Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip, the rumble, rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and and, and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword, glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over their bodies. That was Nahum's rendition of Nineveh. There's so many dead bodies in the street, you're stumbling over them. So Jonah expected these people would mock him and treat him as a fool. He feared that he might even be attacked and killed if he did what the Lord had called him to do. And listen, beloved, don't be too quick to judge Jonah. Imagine if you were Jewish, living during World War II, and the Lord told you, I'm going to bring terrible judgment on Germany. And I want you to go to Berlin and tell Nazi Germany to repent. Okay, that's ancient history. Let me bring it a bit closer. Imagine if God called you, dear Christian, and said, I'm going to bring judgment on Iraq or Afghanistan. I want you to go to Kuwait and tell the people to repent. Or better yet, I want you to go to Gaza. Or even better than that, I want you to go to Jerusalem and tell them folk to repent. And many of us would go to the airport and buy the first class ticket to San Francisco. And from there, we'll hop on a boat to Hong Kong. Come on, ain't no use lying up in here, beloved. It's easy to judge Jonah for punking out on the assignment and running away in his day, but we have to realize that God has given an assignment to, to every Christian today, and that is to preach the gospel. Jesus' last commission should be the church's first mission. He said, go ye therefore and do what everybody, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe how many things, everybody? All things that I've commanded you, and below, be, behold, I am with you always, even to the... And so while some of us are fleeing from our modern-day evangelistic responsibilities, with Jonah's example before us, we have even less reasons than he did for our disobedience. We're losing our evangelistic identity. Y'all don't feel like talking to me today. Yeah, th we used to be a church that would invite people to come to church with us. We would pack our cars with, with visitors to come to church. Anybody remember those days? Now we drive two cars to church with just one individual in it. And we've got to remember to get out of our seats and get on our feet and hit the streets with the gospel beat. Are you hearing me in the house today? And we got to remember that it may be somebody's last opportunity to hear, but it may be our last opportunity to share. And Jesus declares, this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. 
And so if you want to see Jesus as much as I know you do, we've got to share this gospel. If you believe it, say amen. Notice that the path that Jonah chose was a downward path. The Bible says in verse 3, clear your throat, lift your voice, and read with me. The Bible says, but what, everybody? Jonah rose to, to Tarshish from the, and he went where? To, and found a going to, and he, and went to go with them to where? Away from the, so, so, so listen, beloved. Jonah went 2,200 miles in the opposite direction from where God had called him to go. You see, the path to the disobedience, the path of disobedience to God can only lead downward. I don't like how quiet y'all are today. Yeah, anytime you try to escape the presence of the Lord, it is a downward journey. I don't care if you're on a flight up north. It's a downward journey. Uh, it's going down. You, you can take a plane, train, or taxi cab to try to escape the will of God, but it's going down. And allow me to pause here parenthetically to wonder how many times has God sent you to Nineveh, but you went to Tarshish. Y'all need help applying that? L -l -l Let me help you. How many times have God told you to apologize? But you said nothing. How many times have God told you to go to church? But you went somewhere else. Yeah, I'm, I'm just applying it for you today. How many times have God told you to get baptized? But you put it off. How many times have God told you to share my gospel about a Savior who loves everybody and who's coming back to save those that love him? How many times have God sent you to Nineveh, but you went to Tarshish? But David understood something that Jonah needed to understand then and what we need to understand now, and that is you can't run from God. You can't hide from God. There's nothing that you could do that will catch God by surprise. As a matter of fact, David said, where can I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand and shall hold me. You can run from man, but you can't run from God. The Bible says in verse 4, read with me, y'all. The Bible says, but the Lord, who everybody? He did what? He uh, great upon the, and there was a, so that the was it was threatened to break up. Now, we often think of Jesus calming the storms. Say amen. But we must remember that not only is he the God that calms the storms, but he's the God that will stir them up too. The ship and the sailors we're in a dangerous position. Come on, walk with me, y'all. Don't let me lose you. It was nobody's fault but Jonah's. There was nothing wrong with the sailors being on the ship. It was Jonah that had no business being there. And so often we get caught up in what others can do. But we must remember it's not about what they can do. It's about what we cannot do. Are you hearing me in the house today? And I wonder today how many ships are experiencing turbulent waters because we're on board determined to go opposite of God's will. The turmoil of Jonah's disobedience affected everyone on the ship. And can I park on this curb for a minute if I promise to keep my hazard lights on? Because some of you need to be careful who you help. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. We, 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 need to start, we need to start telling y'all to leave y'all phones at the door because I'm watching some of y'all and I lost you already. Are you, can, y'all, can y'all tune back in for just a minute? Yeah, we've got to be mindful of people who we help because hear me today, there are people around us who are experiencing the divine judgment of God for whatever reason and when you got your big head in the way, you're going to get the licks that was intended for them. The sailors began to throw good cargo. They threw money overboard trying to lighten the load. And some of you are investing into people that God is trying to clear their bank account out so that they can learn to lift up their eyes and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. How many resources have you wasted? trying to undo what God is doing. And the one that needed to be thrown out, the one that was causing this whole drama was in the down in the basement watching TV. I wish, I wish, I wish y'all, I wish y'all would apply this for me because y'all, 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 you, you know, y'all not getting with me today. While, while you're trying to work two jobs, uh, while your deadbeat boyfriend is in the basement watching television. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Throw it overboard. Let God handle it. God has a prepared solution. For every prepared problem. I told anybody in the house today. Uh, shall I proceed? Thank you. Yes, indeed. You're not saved at all. Good. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> and the one that needed to be thrown out was in the bottom of the boat sleeping. Yeah, we need to pray and ask God for discernment to know who to help and, and when not to interfere when God is trying to get someone's attention because God speaks through blessings giving and he also speaks through blessings withheld and sometimes he may be withholding blessings to get that individual's attention and here you go getting in the way. I wish, okay. So, so, so it seems evident, according to verse 5, that Jonah was the only true believer on board. Therefore, he had a responsibility to be a bright light for God. But while down in the bottom of the boat, Jonah isn't shining. As a matter of fact, he's sleeping. Not just sleeping, but the Bible says in verse 5, He was fast asleep. Now listen, I know the difference. I've been preaching for 20 years. I know the difference between falling asleep and fast asleep. Yeah, sometimes the heads are nodding and I said, okay, he's falling asleep. But when you hit that left side and then you sink down, that, 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 he's, he's fast asleep. Just leave that joker alone. He'll wake up after the benediction. He's fast asleep. Jonah was fast asleep while the sky was overshadowed with blackness. Jonah was fast asleep while the storm was raging all around, while the waves tossed the boat to and fro, and while the heathen sailors called on their false gods, while every man on board cried out and needed help from the true God, The only one who made, who could have made a difference was sound asleep. Do I have permission to step on my own toes before I step on yours? Uh, Inspiration suggests uh, that tame truth cannot convert sleeping, cannot convert anybody. Uh, It says, sleeping ministers preaching to sleeping people. It says, by tamely presenting the truth, 
merely repeating the theory without being stirred by it themselves, they cannot convert men. If they should live as long as did Noah, their efforts would be without effect. I'm on my toes. Y'all just watch. I'm stepping on my own toes. But I'm coming for yours next. Uh, their love for souls must be intense and their zeal fervent. A listless, unfeeling manner of presenting the truth will never arouse men and women to come from their death-like slumber. They must show by their manners, by their acts and words, and by their preaching and praying that they believe that Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet are careless and stupid and preachers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep themselves. Sleeping ministers preaching to sleeping people. Well, now that my toes are good and swollen, don't tuck yours, I'm coming for them. Uh, because not only are our preachers sleeping, but our pews are occupied by many careless Christians. No, that's not a good term. Church attendees who are asleep as well. Yeah, Jonah slept in a place where he hoped that no one would disturb him. Sleeping church attendees don't like to be bothered or woken up. Some of y'all can't wait till I shut up. Some of y'all can't wait till I get up out of here. But you're going to miss me when I'm gone. Listen, sleeping Christians, they hide out in church. God, God help us not to be like Judas who was in the inner circle with Jesus. He sat on the church board. He came to church and was lost. Jonah slept in a place where he, would not, he could not help uh, with the work that needed to be done. Sleeping Christian, no, sleeping church folk, stay away from the work of the Lord. I know it's hurting. If it, listen, if you can't say amen, say ouch. They are spiritually constipated. They take it all in, and then they leave church, and they'll watch Oakwood, and they'll watch Dr. Knight, and they'll watch Myron, and they'll watch Snell, and they'll share with nobody. Then on one hand, according to Dr. William Curtis, he said, many people are addicted to ministry, but anemic to mission. I'm preaching better than y'all talking to me today. Jo Jonah slept while there was a prayer meeting up on the deck. Sleeping church folk don't like prayer meetings. I told you what to say if you can't say Amen. <laughs> Jonah slept and had no idea of the problems around him. Sleeping church folk don't know what's really going on. They are oblivious to the signs and the, the surroundings. And, 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 and Jonah slept while he was in danger. Sleeping church folk are in danger, but they don't even know it. And catch this. Jonah slept while the heathen needed him. Sleeping church folk snooze on while the world needs their message and their testimony. You ever, you, ever, you ever know somebody that hits the snooze button? I asked that question wrong. Are you one of those people that hits the snooze button? <laughs> and some sleeping Christians may protest that they're not asleep at all. You know, like those people that watch the movies with their eyes closed. And you say, hey, you're missing it. They say, I'm not asleep. You a lie. <laughs> they, they, they say, hey, we talk about Jesus, but listen, you can talk in your sleep. They say, we have a walk for Jesus, but you can walk in your sleep. They say, we have a passion for Jesus. I cried in worship the other day, but don't you know you can cry in your sleep? 
They say, I, we think about Jesus all the time, but you can think in your sleep. We call it dreaming and hear the word of God today. It's time to wake up. The Apostle Paul declares, and do this knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. When the captain of the vessel located the sleeping prophet, he asked the first in a series of questions that Jonah had to face. And as I read this, it became clear to me, thank you, sir, that the conditions of our world, thank you, are no different from those on board the ship that day. The world is engulfed in a great storm and people are perishing and looking for answers to life's questions. They are looking for someone to point the way. Meanwhile, the church folk are fast asleep. Let's look at verse 6. The Bible says, The captain came and said to him, What do you mean? You sleeper. <laughs> what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. So firstly, they inquired about his preoccupation. They inquired about what, everybody? His preoccupation. Jonah was so caught up in his rebellion against God and in going his own way that he was totally oblivious to the conditions around him. I wonder if y'all going to walk with me today. Uh, the modern church is asleep. Preoccupied with petty, insignificant stuff. While the world around us fights for its very life. Listen, we, we've got our own agendas. We've got our own, we've got, we got, we got to get over ourselves, y'all. And, 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 and here's, here's our problem. I, listen, I, I feel free today, so I, you know, I don't know where my security is, but, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it how I feel it. Our problem is, and, and, and this is one of the difficulties of having a new church. You know, our church just turned uh, 17 years old. It's a new church. And, and so we're trying to find the church's identity and personality. Uh, but everybody has their own idea of what the church should look like. And when we don't get our idea promoted, we want to throw the whole thing overboard. You see, one of the benefits of an older church is that it has ingrained in it its personality. And so you know that this church is conservative or this church is liberal. And, and, and if you don't like it, don't go. But when a church is young and, and trying to formulate its, its identity, um, the, the danger is that everybody's idea uh, will, will be promoted, uh, but, but they may not all be grasped. And so we visit Elevation Church or we visit uh, capital city or we visit uh, uh, a church in Texas or a church in California and they do it this way and so we bring it back and say we should do it this way are y'all hearing me but you've got to understand that there is a lot about listen what you see on Sabbath morning or on Sunday morning in any successful church there is so much that goes on behind the scenes to make that come to pass you want your church to look like elevation. Are you willing to take time off of work uh, to come after church, uh, after work to the church to practice and to rehearse and to do the hard work to make sure that we give a good production on the weekend? You see, the problem is we want, we want a ready-made church where we can just sit down and consume and not contribute. And, and, and when we operate in that for a too long of a period, it ends in frustration and friction and fighting. But if we would just get over our own agendas 
if we would just submit to the will of God. The captain, he came and he rebuked Jonah, the prophet, for his prayerlessness. Christ said, my house, if you want to know what your church should look like, here it is, my house shall be called a house of prayer. I wish I, wish I could talk to y'all the way I feel it today. And the tragedy of a sleeping church in a dying world is that when we don't warn those whom God sends us to warn, we may receive the same judgment that was supposed to be ex ex executed on, upon them. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, if, you say, if I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But catch this, his blood will I require at your hand. What a shame when the world has to rebuke us for not doing our job. And how many know that God will sometimes use a crooked stick to straighten out his people? And hear, hear me today, beloved. The world may not say it or they may not act like it, but they want a living, praying, serving church. Listen, the world wants this church to survive more than some of the church folk want this church to survive. Who do they come to when troubles come to them? So Paul, Paul declares, he says, now knowing the time that now is high time. It's not just time, but it's high time. It's beyond time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So number one, they inquired about his, preoccup his preoccupation. Number two, they inquired about his profession. They inquired about his profession. Come on, read with me. The Bible says Jonah 1, 7 and 8. The Bible says what, everybody? And they, come let us so that, and the, and the, they cast lots and the lot fell on who? Listen, y'all got to see this thing, y'all. They said, let's, let's roll the dice <laughs> to see who, <laughs> to, to see <laughs> whose fault is this. <laughs> and they rolled the dice. <laughs> and of all people, <laughs> for it to show up, them dice spelled out Jonah. <laughs> And they said to him, please tell us, for whose sake is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Imagine the embarrassment that Jonah must have felt when he had to declare himself to be a man of God, a prophet of the living God. It's hard to stand when you've blown your testimony. And as Christians, we must never allow ourselves to forget who we are. And what we've been called to do, catch this, despite your mistakes, despite your past, God gives you an assignment. And dear Christian in 2024, my message to you is what is your occupation? And I'm not talking about what you do for a living. I'm talking about what are you doing? Because every blood washed, born again, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized child of God has been given a divine assignment. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Are you on the job for Jesus? They inquired about his preoccupation. They inquired about his profession. Look again at verse 8. They inquired about his pedigree. They said, where do you come from? How can a disobedient running man say that he's coming from God's country? He can't. Our disobedience and sin clouds our testimony and causes our lips oftentimes to be silent. 
They say, where do you come from? What is your country? Jonah was from the promised land, but he didn't live like a worshiper of Jehovah God. And we are literally citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We are pilgrims and we are strangers. We're just passing through this foreign land. And this world as we know it is not our final home. Have I got a witness in the building? They asked him, of what people are you? Jonah was one of the chosen people of God. In like manner, the church is the redeemed people of God. People who are saved by grace. We are people who are heaven bound. We are people who are hell's fireproof. Uh, we are people who are eternally saved and equipped with the truth and power of the almighty God. And our, our activity ought to match our bloodline. If you believe it, say amen. And all these things are true about the Christian. But they're all hollow and empty to the lost world that sees the church as a bunch of self-absorbed, out of touch, irrelevant in their world. The world has every right to question our reality when we do not live up to our standard. They, they inquired about his preoccupation, they inquired about his profession, they inquired about his pedigree, and then they inquired about his purpose. They said in verse 10, is that these men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For these men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he just flat out told them. They said, hold up. This is your fault? <laughs> they said, why did you do this? They, 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 they seem amazed that anyone would act so foolishly to claim to know God and at the same time try to run from him. The reality is that in the world, they would prefer if we left them alone. However, there will come a day where they will point the accusing finger at us and demand to know why we slept while they perished. We need to take the Lord's work very seriously for the day is coming when we will not be able to work. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work. Inspiration says that in the visions of the night, a very impressive scene passed before me. She said, I saw an immense ball of fire falling among some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. And it says, I heard some say we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we did not know that it would come so soon. Others, with agonized voices, said, you knew. Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard similar words of reproach spoken. We ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to question our purpose. We all ought to ask ourselves, why am I here? What am I really doing for God? What does God want me to do? Why do I do what I do? Why do I not do what I need to do? All of these are powerful questions that demand and deserve to be answered by each and every one of us. And so, verse 11 down to verse 16. Let's clear your throat and help me read this uh, nice and loud. Help me read. The Bible says, then what? Mm. For the. Then he said what? Now, hold on. Dude, just do it yourself. Like, why, why you got to involve? You, we, we, we been through enough because of you, Jonah. Uh, if you, if you got to go over, just jump, right? He said, hey, pick me up and throw me over into the sea. All right, keep reading. Then the sea will what? Be, be calm for you. For I know that this is, verse 13, nevertheless, the men to try to return, but they... And the sea continued to do what? Therefore, look at verse 14. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. Now, now, just a few verses ago, they were praying to the false gods. But, but Jonah's testimony of his disobedience caused these men to cry out to Jehovah. They said, we pray, O Lord. Please do not make us perish for, come on, help me read, for this man's life and do not with for you 
have done, so they and and the uh, listen. That's the solution to some of your problems. You throwing out the cargo. You throwing out the valuables. You need to throw that Negro out. No, it's not not everybody. I'm just throwing. This, I'm, I'm throwing, let it let it land where it needs to land. Not everybody. Some of y'all need to stick with him, but some of y'all need to. Th- <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel my help right there. I feel it. I feel. It. Uh, then then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord. They took vows. They inquired about his preoccupation. They inquired about his profession. They inquired about his pedigree. They inquired about his purpose. And then they inquired about his punishment. They said, what should we do with you? The answer they received was the only one that made sense. Cast away the disobedient saint. And this is the modern world's reaction to the church. Come on, sit up. We're landing and it's going to be bumpy. This is our punishment. They simply ignore us. Or worse, they cast us off. The the modern post-COVID world asks the question, what is the purpose of church? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, some church folk have been hurt so bad that they're asking, what is the purpose of church in my life? Where does church fit? This is not how it was during the life of Christ. You see, Jesus was a thermostat and not a thermometer. You see, the thermometer tells the temperature of an area, but a thermostat changes the temperature of an area. And when Jesus spoke, the officers answered, no man has ever spoke like this man before. And in Matthew 9, verse 32 and 33, the Bible says they bought him a man mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled and said, it has never been like this in Israel. Jesus changed the atmosphere because everywhere Jesus went, he touched those around him. His life, because of his holiness, was a challenge to the sinner. It was a light to the seeker. It was food to the hungry. It was forgiveness to the guilty. It was life to the dead. Jesus made a difference. And if we want the world to keep us on board, We've got to challenge ourselves in our meetings on how, first of all, are we making a difference and how can we make a difference? That was Jonah's responsibility to Nineveh and to the people on the ship. And that is our responsibility to the world around us today. These series of questions that they asked Jonah should serve as a wake-up call to all God's children who desire to make a difference in their world. We need to be awake, active, and on deck, letting our lights shine for the glory of God. We could, neither be, we could either be like Jonah or we could be like Jesus. And I know who you're called to be like, but are we, who are we really closer to today, Jonah or Jesus? So as we descend down this homiletical mountain, the Bible says in verse 17, now the Lord prepared a what? A great fish to, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How many days? And now, one thing we must understand, as I said before, is that God always has a prepared problem for a prepared solution. Now, let me keep working on that application of trying to help people that God is dealing with. Nobody knew that when they threw Jonah overboard, that a fish was waiting for him. Yeah, you're, you're afraid to cut that guy loose or that girl loose. You're afraid to, to, to push your son or to motivate them to, 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 to try it on their own, to, let, to try to stretch their wings. But God already has something prepared to catch them. Yeah, we can't do everything. We can't, we can't overdo what God has called us to do. The minute they threw Jonah overboard, the sea was calm. And God had a prepared solution. 
Now let's take a look at the fish. This is going to be good. Uh, well, it was good to me. I don't know if you're going to enjoy it, but let's take a look at the fish. Now let me see before, I, before as, we, as we close. Uh, let me see the hands of those who believe uh, that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. Those who believe Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. All right, hands down. Now let me see the hands of those who believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. All right, less hands. So more say a fish, others say a whale, and the rest are saying, I want lunch. Okay, so let me get to this. I, wanted, I want to close this discourse by sharing that based on my understanding of the Bible, I believe that the fish was actually a whale. Now, why does it matter? Why is that important? Um, I believe it's important because many skeptics consider the story of Jonah to be fictional. Yeah, or allegorical, mythical, because they reject the miraculous element of a man being in a great fish for three days. Anybody want to say Amen. And if what the Bible was referring to as a great fish was in actuality a whale, it makes the story of Jonah seem even more far-fetched because it is humanly impossible for a human being to survive in the belly of a whale. A whale is a mammal, right, with mammalian organs and stomach acid that, dis that disintegrate anything that it consumes. But I believe that it's a whale because it proves that God specializes in the impossible. Well, I thought at least brother and sister James would, sh would shout right there. A and that God is able to keep you in any situation. God, God, God likes to do things in a way that you step back and look uh, and you just have to admit that was nothing but the hand of God. Uh, am I talking to anybody in the building, Sister Sister Sylvia, who's been in a car accident and, and you should have lost your life, but, but, but God kept you and, and he protected you. And, after, and, and, and now that you look back, you say that was nobody but the Lord. Uh, has anybody ever had a sickness and, and you were laid out on the hospital bed, Elder Jones, and, and the doctor? just shook their head and, and they thought that everything was over but but God healed you in a manner that medicine can't explain and now you gotta look back and say that was nobody but the Lord anybody ever lost their job but the bills still got paid you still got the job anybody got a promotion anybody got a raise and you know you didn't deserve it and you gotta say child that was nobody but the Lord, anybody got a house that you don't deserve? Anybody got a car that you don't deserve? Anybody's wife is still putting up at your crazy self? Your husband haven't left you? That's nobody. But the Lord, nobody. But the Lord. And when you read Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2, you would discover that Jonah thought he was in hell. He said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and I heard as my voice. First of all, does anybody want to kick out an amen that God hears your prayers even in disobedience and even in the belly of a whale? Yeah, and... Uh, he, he probably touched the inner stomach of that animal and, and felt the warm-blooded whale and it burned his hand and maybe he thought, man, I done died and went to hell. So allow me, as I close, allow me to quickly explain why I believe, why I'm convinced uh, that the great fish was a whale. You don't have to agree with me, but just hear me out today as we go. Uh, uh, more, more specifically, I believe it was a blue whale. The blue whale uh, is the largest whale which grows about 94 feet long. It's about the height of a nine-story building. Uh, blue whales weigh about 120 tons. Uh, the largest specimen was a female, and she was 94 feet long, weighing more than 174 tons. Uh, the largest of the blue whales are 150 tons, and it has the heart uh, the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's what pounds, uh, uh, the, the, a thousand pounds uh, is the heart, and it, it, it has 14,000 pounds of blood circulating in its body. Uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the aorta blood vessels are so large that a human could ca crawl through them. Uh, blue whales inhabit all the seas except the North and South Poles, and they are rarely seen by the coasts. Uh, and these enormous animals can eat up to four tons of tiny krill and plankton each day. Uh, and, and, and I got all this information about krill and stuff, but that's really not important. Uh, but, but here it is. B whales, uh, they, they, they sift uh, the free-floating protus plants and animals the, through baleen. Uh, it's like a sleeve-like device that whales use to obtain nourishment. Uh, and inside the baleen is uh, edged with hairy plates that filter krill and baleen is made out of keratin that's the same substance that makes our fingernails and it's called whale bone uh, they have these pleated groves that allow their throat to expand during huge intakes of water during filter feeding. And blue whales have 50 to 70 throat groves uh, that run from their throat to their midsection of their body. Uh, a blue whale's tongue is about the size and weight of a full-grown African elephant. Yeah, the African elephant weighs six tons, and so that's about the weight of uh, the blue whale. They, 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 they generally spin, swim three to 20 miles per hour, uh, but they can swim 24 to 35 miles per hour uh, if, they're, if they feel uh, that they're in danger. And, and, but they generally cruise at one to four miles uh, per hour. Uh, and, and through, though far in the background, you can see on the picture there, uh, the blue whale, it dwarfs this diver because uh, uh, blue whales can dive for up to an hour going uh, to a depth way beyond 350 feet deep. Uh, and blue whales, they breed uh, generally in the winter months and in the spring. Uh, within 30 minutes of its birth, the baby whale can swim. And the newborn calf is 25 feet long, weighs 6 to 8 tons. Uh, and now that I've taken you through my feeble attempt of being a marine biologist, uh, what's the point of all of this? Here it is. God's will will be done. Jonah was three days in the well, and it was a three-day journey to Nineveh. And allow me to pause here parenthetically to show the importance and significance of reading God's word. Because God gave the idea for Uber years ago. The whale picked up Jonah from where he was and carried him to where he wants to be. But the idea of Jonah being in the whale supports the truth that not only does God protect, uh, but he preserves. Uh, so even in punishment, uh, we see God's protection uh, and his preservation. Uh, and is anybody grateful that he prepares a table before me uh, in the presence of my enemies? Uh, and even when my enemies uh, are my fault, uh, and even when your enemies uh, are your fault, uh, the enemies might have been uh, a result of you running your mouth uh, but the enemies uh, might have been God's punishment uh, but along with punishment uh, he gives protection uh, and preservation so three days in the fish and the three-day journey uh, to Nineveh. Uh, three days means a time of enlightenment. I'm not going to give you all that, but here's what I want you to catch. Here's what I want you to catch. Uh, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, the Bible says, Jesus said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, the beauty of this text is that it's for me, for me, and you don't have to agree with me, it's irrefutable proof in my mind that it was a whale. Because according to the King James translation of the text, and for some reason the divine author of the scripture saw it fit to call it a whale. Unless any theologian in the room thinks that I'm being contextually or exegetically irresponsible, I'm aware that the word translated as fish Dog, in the Hebrew, it means fish, but the word translated as whale in Matthew 12 and verse 40 is ketos, which means it could be translated as a sea monster, a whale, or a huge fish. And I don't believe that it was by accident that the King James translators translated that word as whale. Because if it ain't in the word, it doesn't deserve to be heard. But if it's in the book, well, to take a look, is that about what the preacher said? It's about what the preacher read. 
And, I, and, and the, the beauty of this story was that the same way Jesus was in the belly of the whale for three days, same way Jonah was in the belly, Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days. And the same way it sounds impossible for God to keep Jonah in the belly of a fish, I'm so glad to let you know that Jesus did the impossible. And I thank God today that Jesus is the real running man because when we ran from him, he chases us. Like the prodigal son's father, he runs towards us. He humiliates himself and he embraces us. And while it may seem and sound impossible for a man to be in the belly of a whale for three days and come out alive but I believe it it may sound impossible for a man to be born of a virgin but I believe it it may sound impossible for a man to live a sinless life to walk the streets of Galilee to heal the blind to heal the lepers to raise the dead I believe it and I'm elephant elated and peacock proud to report to you today that a man named Jesus stayed in the belly of the earth for three days but on the third and appointed day Jesus did the impossible he rose from the grave with all power in his hands that's why the old saints used to sing I serve a risen Savior He's in the world today. Have I got a witness? I know that he is living. Whatever man may say, I see his hands of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him. Have I got one witness in the building? He's always there. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives salvation to impart. You ask me how? I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that I know that I know that I know who holds the future and I know who holds my hand. Come on, say yeah. Give God praise for doing the impossible, for raising on the third day. And because he rose, we can rise. Say yeah. Yeah. The story of Jonah teaches us that God can call anybody and God can use anybody and God can save anybody but we got to tell everybody and so today the doors of this church are open and if in fact you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior listen it was the theme throughout the whole service that God specializes in things that seem impossible. And so don't get hung up on whether you believe as a fish or a whale. Believe what you will. We'll understand it for sure when we get over to heaven. But can we just make it over there, y'all? Can we just be faithful enough to make it over to the earth made new? We'll understand it better by and by. But today, there may be a soul that is weighed in the balance. You're in the valley of decision. And you want to learn more about Jesus. You want to accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Listen, the, Jesus is the sweetest thing that ever happened to me. Have I got one witness in the house? He's the sweetest thing that has ever happened to me. And so while we're all standing in the building today, let us all stand as we get ready to go. If there's somebody that wants to say yes to Jesus, they want to learn more about him, we're having a baptism on April the 6th, and we are looking forward to baptizing some individuals who have said yes to Jesus. And if you want to be a part of that number, if you want to be baptized or rebaptized, if you want Bible studies, or maybe if you want to join this church by transfer of membership or profession of faith, 
Would you move out of your seat, come down the aisle, give me your hand, give God your heart, and say yes to Jesus today. I'm not going to be long, but I need you. If you came knowing that you have some things to settle with God, and he's calling you to go to Nineveh, he's calling you to come down to the altar. Don't run to Tarshish. Say yes to Jesus today. And so today, as the praise team sings, I want to invite you to come down. And listen, every sinner has a future, and every saint has a past. But God, you don't get good to come to God. You come to God to get good. And softly and tenderly today, he's calling you. He's saying, I could clean you up. I could fix you up. Despite your mistake, despite the fact that you ran the opposite direction from my call, he says, I still want to use you. I still want to fix you up. I still want to clean you up. I still want to embrace you and have you as part of my family. And so who would be the first to say yes to Jesus today? Who wants to come down and give your heart to the Lord? Would you move out of your seat? Move out of your seat even now. God is calling you. And don't wait for somebody to be the first. If God is calling you, you be the first. Take that first step. Jesus did it for you. He climbed Golgotha's hill, stretched his arms on Calvary, and died for you and for me. Who would be the first today? Who wants to say yes? You want to be baptized or rebaptized? You want Bible studies? You want to join this church by profession of faith or transfer of membership? Come on. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Receive. Yes. Take it from the top. My hallelujah belongs to you. I'm waiting for you, dear gentlemen, dear lady, to say yes to Jesus. If you, if you want to say yes to Jesus today, just come at this time. The doors of this church are open for you. Don't let this opportunity pass. You got to come while Jesus calls you. Is there somebody that want to say yes? move at this time. God bless you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And though here's my worship. Here's my worship. Almighty Father and our God, today we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor and we give you all the praise because, Lord, you are worthy. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son to sacrifice his life on Calvary's cruel cross for each of us. Lord, we thank you for taking our sin away and filling us with your Holy Spirit. Father, I feel in my heart that there's somebody in this building today that needs to accept you as their Lord and personal Savior. So I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will give them the courage that they need to make to make a stand for you. Show them pictures of the cross. Remind them what Christ did for each of us when he stretched out his arms on Calvary's cross. 
purchased salvation for us so that we can just accept it and receive it full and free. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for the times where we've gone the opposite direction from where you've sent us. Forgive us for when we've done the opposite things of what you've told us to do. And Father, please restore in each of us other opportunities for us to let the world know that you love them, you died to save them, and that you're coming back to receive them. Father, we pray that all of us will be in that number when the saints go marching in. Because God, we just want to see you and spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with you. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, our Lord, our soon coming King, Jesus the Christ. Let everybody that believes shout amen. Give God another praise. We, we just like Jonah is faced with an uncomfortable message that we must tell the world are we going to run or are we going to give it to people it's very uncomfortable but that's why God has put placed you here and I here to do it because you don't know who will give their heart to God and be saved because of you that's the challenge. But God will give you the, the faith and the comfort to do it. And somebody will be in heaven just because of you. As I close, I would want to remind you that next week will be the opening of the Health and Wellness Center here. And also, are we going to attempt to restart the senior exercise program for this church on Fridays? A moving body is a living body and a healthy body. There's so many things that work that we need to do, know about health and healing that God has for us. You see, soon, I'll tell you this, most of us, Unless we accept the mark, it's not going to be accepted in the hospital. In fact, you're going to be in a run. And if something goes wrong, you need to know what to use in case somebody gets sick. That might even save your life from being in jail. I just want to let you know that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to show you how to do these things. You'll apply them. I do this almost every week. And it shows that God works. We just have to be able to know and God, the Holy Spirit, will bring the things to your mind. What to do? And you praise God for the healing that shall take place because of God will use you. Everybody here needs to know. Let us pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, you have spoken to us. You have given us a message of warning. And you give us a message of joy. For Jesus, when one sinner gives his heart to you, uh, there's joy in heaven. And so, Father, as we, as we go out from this place, we just thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has touched us, that no matter what, we will tell somebody about Jesus in his soon return. And bring us back next week, Father, where we could come back and worship you in spirit and truth. And as we, we, we begin to go now soon into the food for the seniors, we ask God that you would bless it. May it do our bodies good uh, for your own sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you again.
people allow us to hear your message, but may we be active for you because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated while the ushers usher you out.